Thank you for joining us today. My name is Brad Miller, and this is the Chronically Human Podcast, where we have discussions aimed at creating a better world with more individual freedom and less unnecessary suffering. Today, our guest is Pete Earle. He is a former trader and global financial analyst on Wall Street, an Austrian economist, and research fellow at the American Institute for Economic Research. He's also the author of the book, A Century of Anarchy, Neutral Morse Net Through the Revisionist Lens. We spend a good part of our conversation talking about Neutral Morse Net, which was a tiny territory in Europe that demonstrated for over a hundred years that when people are left alone, an emergent order of peace and prosperity can be created through voluntary cooperation without the need of a central authority. He discusses how Morse Net came into existence, its unique competing system of justice, why this incredible place no longer exists, and the lessons this forgotten chapter of history can teach us all today. Pete reminds us as well that anarchy doesn't mean the absence of rules. It simply means the absence of rulers. Neutral Morse Net is an example of what can happen when people are left alone in peace. Pete also gives his thoughts on the current resurgence of socialism in America, the power of decentralization to create more freedom, and his common sense approach to spreading the ideas of individual liberty, peace, and prosperity to others. Pete is very optimistic about the future and gives examples that support his belief. I ex- Thank you, Pete, for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Well, I'm really fascinated by your work because I've been uh, in the freedom philosophy, been studying that for about 10 years now, and I was unaware of the neutral Morse net. I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly. Uh, probably yeah, not. Morse net. Morse net. And your book, A Century of Anarchy, is absolutely fascinating. I want to dive into that, maybe get your thoughts on crypto and also on uh, modern monetary theory and the rise of socialism in America. I think that's uh, definitely a big issue going on. But before we get into that, how did you get started as an economist and specifically in the ideas, the ethics and the economics of individualism? Sure. So I uh, so I spent uh, about 20 years as a trader in the financial markets. Uh, when you when you engage in financial markets, you wind up getting a lot of side lessons in the perniciousness of regulation, um, in uh, the sometimes the uh, the perverse effects of trying to build markets uh, uh, or, or not allow them to evolve spontaneously, that sort of thing. So that. Plus, uh, being in New York City on September 11th, and a number of other factors really all, all came together. Um, I was never, you know, either a far right winger or a far left winger. I was always kind of moderate. But um, the effects of both uh, my career and seeing uh, just getting older, I guess, uh, led me towards uh, a more libertarian or, 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 or a libertarian view of, uh, of, of um, economics and politics and human interaction. Well, definitely. I think the older you get, the more that you do see the perniciousness of regulations and about how it does really limit uh, human potential. I think that's one thing that's not talked about a lot. In one of your articles, you talked about that. You know, when you have war, um, that you have the destruction of all these millions of people's plans. It's not just the, the pain and suffering that's been caused, but it's their lives that could have been lived. Sure. And uh, I mean, going back to what I was saying about Wall Street is it seems like for for decades, it, it actually doesn't seem like it is the case that for decades, um, the, 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 the securities markets have been a product of tinkering and then trying to fix the effects of the tinkering and then new interest groups trying to influence that. And it's really a microcosm of what happens in a very large scale or larger scales between nations or when we try and, uh, you know, design new ways of interfering or whether the intentions are good or not um, in people's lives and for, for, for the you know, attainment of purposes, which otherwise markets and this spontaneous order uh, would allow for. Yeah, and I like the idea of sp- spontaneous order. That's not talked about a lot. The invisible hand, as Adam Smith talked about um, so many centuries ago. That sure. When we talk about anarchy, and that's what your book is about, a century of anarchy, uh, you wrote that anarchy is not the absence of rules. It's the absence of rulers, and I think that's an important point. Yeah, it has to do with uh, with the emergence of norms and uh, of, of local uh, people, people with, with local knowledge and with, with local um, 
uh, uh, responsibilities and all that, influencing the people around them. It's a bottom up rather than a top down way of establishing order. So, you, you know, I guess the expression you could use would be uh, order without law, that sort of thing. Um, um, you know, structure without rules uh, or not not without rules, structure without uh, you know decrees, that sort of thing. The arbitrariness of what we live under now seems to be the opposite of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the the very idea that somebody in Washington D.C. can 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 sign something that'll affect everyone from Anchorage to say, uh, you know, the the the, the Florida Keys and uh, Hawaii and uh, Texas and everywhere in between is is ludicrous. That one size fits all plan that. That's what a lot of people exactly. miss, miss about socialism is that they vote one time, but there's millions of decisions being made by other people for them, and they and you have no say in it. Right, right. That's exactly the case. Yep. And your book, A Century of Anarchy, why did you write that? What brought you to that? Because I, I've read a lot about anarchy and about those ideas, but I wasn't aware of neutral Morrisnet or about the idea of the feudalism – when feudalism broke apart – that there were these independent kingdoms, and this was kind of like the last one of those. Yeah. So, so how your first question was, how did I come to to learn about uh, or or to study neutral Morrisnet? I don't remember exactly, but uh, the best I can re I can recall, um, I was looking at old coins, and there was a Morrisnet two franc coin, and when I saw it, I didn't, I had never heard of it before, so it led me to do more research, and it turned out that there was this small what was called a condominium, which is really essentially a neutral zone, administered and overlooked by a number of states. But it's actually it, it itself is not a state; it's a territory. Um, and usually, with the formation of a condominium, come a number of rules. No troops are allowed inside. It has to be self-administered. That sort of thing. Mm. And so, neutral Morsnet was one that lasted, that existed for about a hundred years. Very hard to find on the map at the time. It was uh, on a, essentially on a mountainside in modern-day. Uh, Belgium and in, in the southern area of modern Belgium and um, the, it was set up aside because at the end of the Napoleonic Wars um, there was nowhere really to get good zinc and zinc was necessary for a lot of industrial applications and so nations at that time the European nations in drawing up um, um, the, the treaties um, didn't want to go to back to war again so what they decided was that this great source of zinc this mine in, in what was called Calmus also called La Calamine um, should be designated as a neutral zone so all nations could have access to it. So initially, it was overseen by the Netherlands and Prussia. That eventually became Belgium, the Netherlands, and Germany. And uh, again, it was it started out, the troops weren't allowed inside. They had a mayor. Um, there was one police officer assigned to it. Uh, there was a, it was essentially 250 uh, miners and their families. And there was a, a they lived in essentially um, cottages and that sort of thing. It's very simple, at least initially. It's fascinating because when we think of the end of the Napoleonic Wars, that's not something that we're taught much about, especially in the states right. here. And and the the century of anarchy with neutral Morsnet, it is the idea that people can work together without a central state doing those top-down decrees, I think that's something most people don't even consider a possibility nowadays. Yeah, and more than that, the, uh, the Burgermeister, who is essentially the mayor, um, there, there were maybe five of them during the hundred year period that Morsnet uh, was, was, was a viable entity. And um, there were at least three years where there was nobody at all in charge. And even, even though there was a burgermeister assigned at various times, uh, all the accounts I have uh, say that he was more interested in playing pool and drinking beer down by the lake with the uh, police officer. So there was not a lot of, over, uh, of oversight of people's lives. And uh, over time, uh, restaurants, uh, bars, uh, at least some brandy distilleries, a couple of farms all grew and all because there was really nobody telling the people more than what they could or couldn't do. Now, do you think the location had a lot to do with it with geography? I've studied a lot about seasteading, and I think that's an exciting extension of this idea that uh, if, if you can isolate yourself enough, maybe you can have freedom. Yeah, I, I mean, at this time, uh, that was a major factor because it wasn't included on most maps. 
Um, there are a couple of tales of people trying to reach it and just getting lost, even asking engineers and people running train stations in Europe, how do I get to Morrisnet? And they would say, I've never even heard of it before. So that was a big part of it. Another part of it, though, uh, has to do with the fact that um, mountains, and this was a mountainside community, mountains tend to generate this sort of fierce independence in people. And that's that's as true for Morsnet as it is today for certain areas of the Appalachians and in the highlands of Vietnam and many other places. Um, mountains are kind of hard to cultivate. Uh, they're hard to access. They require a lot of hard work to, you know, whether it's grow food in or sort of tame. And so uh, people who, who, who manage to settle these high areas in any part of the world often tend sociologically to be very uh, resistant to outsiders. Yeah, that's a fascinating idea about geography influencing um, the way people think and behave. I, that's not something that I've thought much about, to be honest with you. But it makes yeah. sense that if you're in a harsh environment, you really do have to help your neighbors. It's kind of almost like the law of the sea. You know, if somebody's in distress, you right. go out and help them. Yeah, and, it's, and that's just it. And so added to that is the fact that mining communities, and there's a history of this even in the um, – in the uh, Yukon and in the gold rushes uh, that the U.S. experienced, mining communities tend to be self-administered, like wagon trains. They have their own constitution. They designate their own rules. And so that was definitely the case in Moorsnet, as was the fact that Moorsnet was, was specifically cut out of any sort of policing and all that. There were border markers around the edge so that soldiers weren't allowed to go inside. And over time, over the next, over the first, say, 40 or 50 years, many people started to, to gather there and, and for, for purposes outside of the main of the main reason for this condominium existing, which was mining. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the mine did eventually close up, right? And it didn't, instead of the town folding up, like we've seen in a lot of places around America when industry leaves or when a mine shuts down, the towns, you know, basically dissolve. But there it was a different story. Yeah, as the mine spat out its last zinc, and oh, by the way, I should I should mention that one of the reasons why nobody, I think, for the first 60 or 70 years of Moorsnet really took a close look at it is because it was spitting out tons and tons of zinc, and that's what it was supposed to do. So why would why would anybody mess with a good thing? Gotcha. So anyway, yeah, by by, by 1900, uh, the 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 mine was exhausted, but there were there was a very to read the accounts of people who were there. There's not a lot written about it, but what what is written says it was a very vibrant sort of uh, uh, economy there of, again, restaurants, bars, distilleries, some farms, uh, all that sort of thing. And, and uh, there was, there's, I mean, there was no reason for it to shut down. Although in, in, in the, maybe in the period between 1900 and 1910, there were a few uh, efforts to uh, try to seduce the people of Moorsnet to put a few uh, large casinos there, uh, which uh, that actually got the attention of the king of Belgium, and he uh, he he did drop the hammer at that time and say there's going to be no uh, casinos here. Somebody would want to set up casinos there to compete with Monaco oh. was the idea, right? And because it was it was a regulation-free or very relaxed regulation environment, it seemed like the perfect place. Now you talk about the coins from there. Now, did they mint their own like gold and silver coins, or was it like a zinc product, or what kind of coins were they? Yeah. So, so the records I have show that there were two coins. One, I believe, was just of nickel and silver, and one was actually gold. Mm -hmm. Now, the extent to which these were actually used in Moorsnet, I do know that the various currencies of the nations around them were accepted. I think I read one account where they said that they, people did use the coins, but it's as possible that they were sort of tokens, and they're extremely rare today. Oh, okay, gotcha. And that, that reminds me of what's going on with uh, cryptocurrency and competing currencies. You know, Hayek, you but, know, he talked about that, about the idea yeah. that we should Denationalization have of currencies, yeah. Hayek's idea about denationalizing currencies is, is really found its most uh, near-perfect implementation in cryptocurrencies. And I see the, the parallel with, uh, with Morsnet as an isolated geographical location that has something of value that people want. And I think cryptocurrencies, and particularly Bitcoin, I'm a Bitcoin guy, I've got Bitcoin but not bank shirts, um, that it, it produces something that people want, which is money that's not tied to the state or the central banking system. 
Right, right. So I'm always reminded of the line when I think of like of either Bitcoin or any other crypto or or um, or uh, neutral mortgage or anything. I always think of the line: "Liberty is extremely dangerous, but it's the safest thing out there." I like that. That's exactly right. It is. And I think what Bitcoin, what I really like about it, I was a banker for 13 years. And so I saw, I went through the, the financial crash and all of that. And that's why, that's why I went to, you know, started looking for alternatives. And, yep. you know, Hayek was right on the money about competing currencies and Satoshi Nokomoto, he actually um, put Bitcoin out, created it because of the financial crisis. What do you think yeah. about the upcoming financial crisis? Do you see one on the head coming up ahead? And, and what do you think crypto, what do you think the crypto space will look like in that world? So, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to make any predictions, but we have a very cyclical financial system and economy, partially because of the fact that we are uh, we're, we're, we're monetarily monetarily um, influenced by the Federal Reserve and all that. So I think I think a financial crisis or, or recession at least is inevitable when I don't know. Right. Um, but but I, I would say this. Um, I would not be surprised if in the next one there's a the, the the or if the next one is that sort of catalyst that forces more people to embrace crypto. Mm -hmm. That will be the catalyst. Simply uh, the, the simply rising in price, you know, astronomically the way it did did attract some people. But I think the utility value will probably become evident. Uh, whenever the next financial crisis or recession or whatever it is strikes America. We've seen that already to some extent in Venezuela, um, a little bit with the recent uh, uh, problems in, Venez uh, in uh, Zimbabwe and some other places. But I think uh, when the U.S. sees its next recession, whenever that might be, uh, that will be, uh, I think, uh, an extremely um, uh, important moment for, for Bitcoin and the other cryptos. Yeah, definitely. I would agree with that. It's hard to predict and making predictions is yeah. not something that anybody can really do. Otherwise, we would... I, uh, you know, Bitcoin is what? It's almost $4,000 uh, per coin now. And that's a price. Bitcoin has not fundamentally changed. All of the uh, economic principles and all of the great uh, benefits that it offers um, over fiat currencies and all that sort of thing are still there. Mm -hmm. It's just at a low price. So, I mean... It, it, it scales easier when it's uh, at a higher price because the uh, Satoshis, the, the minimum units, are that much more valuable. That's obvious. But Bitcoin is the same Bitcoin it was five years ago. And that's what's incredible, too, that it's only been really it's, – it's a very young technology, too. And there are people who are predicting the end of the Internet, you know, back in the early 90s, you know, that – Oh, sure. Yeah, it, it was going to go the, away. The internet was about as useful the, – that idea that the, the Internet was going to be about as useful as a fax machine. Yep, exactly. How'd, how'd that work out? And I'm sure the government is still using fax machines. Yeah, or 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 um, or uh, what were the other things? Uh, teletypes, right? Yeah. yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, to think about. Uh, going back to Morsenet about the idea of emergence and spontaneous order. Why do you think? Mm -hmm. Do you think it's important to have a shared um, location and a shared kind of ethics and morality and even a language? For something like that to exist, or do you think that there's something else going on that allows for spontaneous order? I think it can take form. So, so are you asking, do people need to be physically proximate, or can that same thing happen in terms of like an online community or people linked by, say, just a currency like Bitcoin or something like that? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And they don't have to yeah, be the I same don't... demographic or the same language necessarily, but they do have to share some characteristics. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would. I would say there has to be something linking them. Uh, you know, we can see it. I mean, we see that in, 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 in gaming where communities arise and they're really linked only by an online, uh, by a shared online experience by people from around the world and they become very tight knit and they develop their own norms, their own uh, their own their own rules of conduct, all that sort of thing, and uh, it's all done without one person saying, you know, do this uh, up above. I mean, sometimes leaders emerge, and sometimes people choose someone to make those decisions. But that's a lot different than being born into a system or coming under the thumb of a system that, uh, that that chooses you, uh, opting in versus opting out, so to speak. 
That's a great point because I looked at opting out of social social security about 13 years ago. And, uh, you know, if you go down that rabbit hole, it doesn't end well for you. So I'm just letting people know that, uh, you know, that's not something that you can really opt out of. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, definitely. Now, with Morse, that the, the people were a tight-knit group. It was an isolated location, but they also produced something of value. Who owned the mine at that time, and how did they divide up the resources? Well, the, the mine was owned uh, by a company. Uh, I believe the company was... It might even be a company to this day after many, many centuries, uh, decades and centuries of mergers and breakups. But uh, Viel Montan was the was the old mountain. Um, I can't remember that was the name of the plot of the company. But there was a mining company. And essentially, the mining company hired the miners and it uh, supplied them with certain benefits. But uh, for the most part, the people really mining was their job and they went about their business when they were done. I gotcha. So they were. So it's the idea that if a if a company owned a seastead, like if they bought an old oil rig or something like that, they would actually own it. But then people could live and work on it, and you wouldn't have to have a lot of top down rules to make that happen. No, definitely not. Yep. And and, and again, there was there was one police officer and there was a mayor, and again, the image that uh, keeps. Uh, um, coming up in a couple of accounts is that they would be down by the lake drinking beer and playing pool. Yeah, that's it. Would be nice instead of uh, SWAT teams kicking in doors trying to find people <laughs> who own some plants. Right, or getting pulled over for going two miles an hour over the speed limit. I much prefer that cop drinking a beer and playing pool. Exactly, I, I I agree with that, and I think that when people hear anarchy, they immediately go back to like. In my opinion, like the, the 20s and a little bit earlier, where the anarchists were planting bombs and they were basically the terrorists right. at the time. Yeah, they think of the the heavily bearded bomb throwers of Chicago in the 1880s and 1890s. Uh, but that's, that's not at all uh, what we're talking about. We're talking about spontaneous orders. We're talking about voluntary uh, uh, groupings of society. We're talking about... Uh, that sort of thing. We're not talking about. And by the way, even those people, even though those people were called anarchists, most of them were far left agitators. Most of them were were, were essentially communists um, who were looking to upend uh, the uh, what they perceived as the robber barons or the and a corporate dictated social order um, in order to pave way for a revolution. So they were actually creating anarchy to destabilize the existing order. I think we we see a lot of that today with certain policies that are proposed, like the voting age going down to 16, I think is absolutely insanity. <laughs> uh, that, that is silly, but uh, I think it's just, it just, it just points to the desperation of, uh, of political uh, officials. They, uh, they, they want, they, they're seeking to, I mean, I mean, if you look at all the initiatives right now in terms of voting, the idea is to you know, variously to get rid of the electoral college, mm -hmm. to lower the voting age, to let just about anybody who wants to vote vote. I mean, obviously, uh, the political system is staked and uh, counting as its asset the mob, just sheer masses of people voting. Uh, you know, it's a it, it's it's a rather heroic exercise to justify voting and democracy, um, especially when you have to make assumptions about the average level of intelligence and the average willingness of people to put the interests of others before themselves. In other words, to vote for, say, a better, you know, a more stable or a more uh, healthy um, uh, fiscal, uh, uh, a, a better, say, fiscal balance sheet um, than, uh, than, say, to vote more money from the uh, Treasury for themselves. So that's, I mean, to me, uh, inclusiveness in voting is just an appeal to increasingly larger groups of people who are going to tend to vote more in terms of short term interests rather than, you know, the long term needs of the country or, or, or people in yeah. general. And I think that is definitely the mob mentality. They're trying to get these massive people to, to shift things so they can benefit politically. So, you know, everybody right. who's the, I think I look at politicians as salesmen, you know, they're selling something because they're going to benefit from it. Right. Right. There's a, there's a line that was used uh, at one point. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was Reagan. Um, 
Reaganite, but he said, you know, freedom is never more than one generation from extinction. It has to be fought for and protected. And uh, I think, uh, I, fr I frankly think with uh, some of the later developments we've seen and with the leftward shift of one of the two parties, uh, this is the time. This is definitely the time we should th start trying to promote libertine values more than we have in the past. I think it's more, there's more at stake now than it has been in a long time. I would agree with that. You know, every election they seem to, it's the most important, but I think it's the most important every time that government grows because right now government is at $7 trillion costing the American people. And, you know, people are voting to kind of divvy up that pie. And I think that's a, that's a very dangerous trend that we're seeing. Sure, sure. Yep. It's uh, say a republic uh, as long as you can keep it. <laughs> that's right. And with the idea of neutral Morse net, you know, it was a small group of people relatively at the beginning. Now, do you right. think decentralization is a key part of this story as well, that it was more decisions were made on the local level close as close to the individual as possible? Yeah, definitely. And and the thing is that at that time also, I mean, Morsnet started as, I believe, 250, 256 maybe uh, miners and their families. And uh, by the time uh, World War One started, there were over 5,000 people there. And what the thing that is noteworthy about that is that uh, most of the people who wound up there found about it, found out about it on their own. There was never there were never any sort of advertisements or never any uh, 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 travel agents or anyone else sending people there or, or letting people know. Mm -hmm. People heard by word of mouth that there was this place in the heavily forested uh, areas west of the Aken forests, up in the mountains of, uh, or in the hills of uh, southern uh, Belgium, which uh, offered a pretty good chance to do what you wanted and, uh, and, and uh, take advantage of a very low-touch regulatory and legal environment. Now, what do you think about, uh, you, you touched on the, the judicial systems that they had. They had basically three types of systems that they could actually right. uh, have their, tra uh, their, um, their complaint or their case tried before. And, right. and the, the competing judiciary, I think, is a fascinating concept. Yeah, so the idea that, uh, I, I just actually wrote a, um, a peer-reviewed paper about this idea, but the idea of bringing markets to bear on the legal system um, is something that's being discussed more and more now. But in, in, in neutral Morsnet, there was actually a kind of a primitive form of that because um, uh, when neutral Morsnet was established, it was dictated that the form of law or that the law regime there would be what's called Code Napoleon, which was a very, uh, to my understanding, a very sort of uh, strictly worded and, uh, and, 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 and really not, not terribly overbearing legal system. Nearby was the um, Aliman uh, Landrecht system, which was uh, in Prussia. Mm. And that used, it was described as having very loose language, but being really, really strong on private property rights. Mm. And then for people who wanted to get, uh, the, I guess you would say the equivalent of either arbitration or mediation, for people who really wanted to cut to the chase, there was the Burgermeister. And there were stories about people walking up to him and saying, you know, we have a dispute. Can you do this? And they said he would uh, 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 whistle a tune, maybe walk away for a minute, come back and then say, this is what you should do. Or, you know, this is this would be my decree. And uh, anecdotal, but uh, still worth mentioning, is that one of the one of the accounts says that nobody ever disputed one of his decisions that he was uh that he was kind of viewed uh, he was respected for his judgment now there are five of them so i don't know which one they're talking about specifically or it may have been a uh, uh, uh sort of a phenomenon across all of them that the burgermeister's decisions were pretty well reasoned and uh it offers really on the spot justice if you don't want to go through court systems and legal fees and whatever else is required back then that's that seems to be very much preferable to what we have today with the judiciary is really a separate part of the community and there he was actually an integral part of the community and i think that right. trust there was, in, I mean, he had he had skin in the game right. he, he lives there too so right that's exactly it and also um there's a there's a reputational factor as well exactly and reputation i think we had professor deidre mccluskey from uh she's an economist and she was talking yeah. about the importance of bourgeois virtues and the idea that you know in in people who have to deal with others as uh, equals 
you know, when they're, when they're talking with each other, that honesty right. and reputation are, are critical. Yeah, reputation was uh, really the, 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 the first version of a credit rating anybody ever had uh, back uh, when communities were young. Uh, that was that was your you know all these things we've heard of in movies where this you know your word is your bond and all that sort of thing you know your reputation it takes as the kind of a cliche saying goes reputation is, is critical because you can spend a, a lifetime building it up and with one word or one action destroy it so a lot of, so so certainly back at that time and even today in many areas reputation is worth far more than uh, what some credit rating, rating agency or uh, another sort of institution uh, labels label someone as. And I think that's important, the outsourcing of trust that we've done with these third parties, I think is very dangerous because they, they have different agendas. And I, I think of Equifax for a long time, you know, you couldn't even see your credit report and then you had to pay to see it. And then, and I think the idea that uh, banking used to be more of a community type issue where the people had a reputation and you know if, the, if it was somebody's son, then they would take care of it if something did happen. Yeah, there's a story about a Swiss banker uh, I read some time ago and it said that, um, and this was in, I believe, Geneva, uh, the day he died, the people who wept the hardest at his funeral were people who had not yet paid back the loans because they were upset that they would never get a chance to show him that they were good for it, which I think is really, I mean, that's today, <laughs> how many people would say, you know, uh, oh, he's dead, you know, that's, uh, I, I, you know, I don't know the money anymore, or, you know, that's, uh, that's the end of that deal. But uh, apparently it was such a thing, and I guess it was the late 1800s, that um, people wanted to prove to this guy, this really well-known banker in Switzerland, that they that, that his trust in them was not was not poorly uh, uh, undertaken. It was, that it was not uh, mis you know wrongly founded. Now, what do you think about the de like the the centralization in America, where communities have really been broken up with people moving to the cities and and the attraction to that? Personally, I think a lot of that had to do with. Um, when they put in the, um, the the highway system, you know, and that was basically put in for war, you know, we're still paying for that. The, the Eisenhower uh, exactly. National Highway System, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that really led to, I think, a destruction of a lot of people. I think it's good that people had the ability to move, but at the same time, I don't know if people were ready to disconnect from those communities like they have. Yeah, I mean, so cities represent they're, they're interesting because originally cities were spontaneously ordered and uh, cities have a lot of value in that um, information travels quickly and uh, firms can locate there and, and access a wide variety of skills and experience levels and all that sort of thing. But as, as municipalities have grown in size and uh, uh, some of the things, well, let me just suffice to say cities are no longer spontaneously ordered. They're planned, and with that comes a lot of the downsides of planning. I mean, I did an interview last week where I spoke about the pension crises that are facing some major cities, and uh, it's hard to believe that they won't get much worse because there's actually no incentive to fix them. And that's and that's a great point about incentives that we talk about. You know, in a small community, you have an incentive to protect your reputation and to deal fairly with others. Absolutely. And the farther you get away from, or the ability to to leave. A lot of times, people will um, will will not necessarily be honest, and especially if trust sure. is 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 outsourced to the government, because that's what a lot of people are doing now. Is they're saying, well, the government will regulate everything, so we don't have to worry about checking out companies. We don't have to worry about making sure that we're dealing with people that uh, we think right. we should be dealing with. I always viewed um, the. Uh, I'm not even sure if it's still around, but uh, growing up, there was always a. A magazine and a television show called Consumer Reports, mm -hmm. and I thought that was a great example of a for-profit, you know, non-governmental rating agency of sorts. Exactly, and I think too, if you didn't have the huge regulatory burden, just like if you didn't have the welfare state, you would have private actors working voluntarily together to fill those needs. Yep. yep. Now, when you when you wrote that book, A Century of Anarchy, what was the response that you got to that? Because I think that's that's something that a lot of people have never heard about. Yeah, so um, it was exactly that. Many people hadn't heard about it. Um, a lot of people complained it was too short. And I said, I used every scrap of information I had. <laughs> right. Although uh, probably this year, next year, there will be a second edition. Mm 
Okay, fantastic, good deal. Because uh, one of the things, one of the things that did happen uh, was was the people from uh, who live in Moorsnet today and uh, who are in that area uh, sent me emails and things, and they said, "Oh, my grandfather was a miner there, and you know." He said this, and uh, a whole bunch of new anecdotes and things like that have come out. So my, mine was the first book on Neutral Morsnet since 1882. Since then, I have seen a few more articles, but nothing really substantive. Now, what do you think about the anarchy today? Do you think it's going to be only on, uh, online, or do you think that there's actually going to be places like free cities or seasteading or different places where they put these principles into action? I'd love to think that it could happen somewhere like a Liberland or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but just knowing that the UN has a protocol for dealing with stateless people, for uh, there is actually something in the, one of the UN uh, uh, guidelines about uh, taking responsibility for stateless people. It seems unlikely. Um, I, I I I stay away from gleeful collapsitarianism, but I feel like to some extent. Uh, somewhere where the central state were to be weak or overextended, somewhere like uh, one of the larger countries in the world, it has more of a chance of working. Oh. I, I, mean, I, would, I would be happy with a world that looks more like, say, Brooklyn, where, you know, it's all Brooklyn, but there are neighborhoods and neighborhoods have sort of different codes. There's no fixed borders. You can move from one to the other, but people in a given neighborhood, in a given street know each other and, um, you know, my handle on uh, Twitter is L1KNB, which is Let a Thousand Nations Bloom. That's what it stands for. Okay. And that's exactly the idea. Well, that's great. I like that idea that uh, the more competition we have in everything, whether it's um, justice or currency or with competing legal systems, I think that's a good sure. thing. Sure. I, I, I grew up in a, in a suburb of New York City. And um, some, some of the, not all the streets in, my, in our town, but some of them have what were called block captains. And it was a, a, a universally agreed upon person who would spread news around and they would have barbecues sometimes. And that person became a spontaneously, voluntarily sort of elevated, um, not a ruler by any means, but sort of a, an anchor for the community without having any real decrees. But I can tell you that uh, one of my friend's uh, father was the uh, black captain of their street, and people were always coming over asking for information, seeing what he knew. And at times, even the mayor would talk to him and say, hey, can you tell these people this? So, I mean, these things, I think people overthink the simplicity of it. I think it happens all the time, and we don't even see it. This term, this sort of spontaneously ordered, um, bottom-up sort of uh, way of, uh, of of administering our lives, or, or or administering, you know, whatever it is that needs to be handled. Because I think most people live their day-to-day -day life as a libertarian, and they only vote conservative or socialist uh, in the voting. That's vote. that's undoubtedly true. Most people. If you ask them questions which have vaguely libertarian, at least I've found, I shouldn't speak more that broadly, but most people who I know would never call themselves a libertarian. But if you ask them a question that has vaguely libertarian overtones, they, they, they usually say, you know, I, I just want to mind my own business. You know, I don't care until they are on my front lawn. <laughs> you know, I don't care what they do. Exactly. And I think yeah. that's important that, uh, that people understand that a lot of times I think libertarianism is viewed as protection for big business. That's what I hear a lot from the left, yeah. that you need yeah. a big government to control big corporations. What's your, what's your thoughts on that? It's an absurd idea because, I mean, if the idea that people are evil, so we should put people in charge is, 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 is ridiculous. But also the fact that it's not even putting people in charge. It's that we have a system which, for better or worse, winds up elevating most of the worst people in society, the ones who are most willing to lie, cheat, steal, do favors, treat other people's property like it's uh, or, or treat people and their property like uh, pieces on a chess set. So uh, I, I've heard that, too. And, and I think it's ridiculous, this idea that if it weren't for the government, you know, uh, food companies would sell spoiled food or company or, or, or automobile companies would sell cars that were defective. Right. Because. What better way to stay in business than to kill your customers? It's, it's absurd. It's absurd. The, the if I mean, capture theory alone, um, you, know, you know, shows very clearly that company that that regulators wind up start maybe they may start with the best of intentions, 
but they but uh, they inevitably uh, become a uh, a, 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 an, a method of, of, of dictating rules and, and prohibiting competition. I think a perfect example of that is the pharmaceutical industry. We've had on Dr. Uh, Mary Ruard on talking about that, and her take is that in the the FDA, they were originally to keep poison out of food, basically. And then in 1962, they changed over to regulating efficacy. And that's been a huge disaster. And I think that's what's caused the rise in prices and all this mess that we see on the pharmaceutical side. And it's like kind of like Frederick Bastier talks about the seen and the unseen, and we don't see what really right. caused it. Right. Well, the other thing is that the, uh, the, the system of uh, patents and copyrights allows for essentially monopolistic control of a product and, uh, and therefore, you know, outsized. Uh, I mean, I don't think their profits are my business, but uh, prices are definitely my business if I have to buy medication or something like that. And the idea that they prohibit competition uh, on this sort of shaky grounds that they need to recoup the prices of, uh, of research and all that is, is I mean, that, that's... That's not an explanation satisfactory for a five-year-old. Exactly. And I think that that system is so corrupt now. There's a, we had Philip Zweig on, and he was a, he's a journalist, and he investigated the, the group purchasing organizations. There's four massive corporations that I had no idea about. They control 90% of what hospitals buy, and they get kickbacks from vendors to buy market share uh, due to this sure. 1987 law. And the corruption is so deep that we don't even really know what's caused what we're seeing today. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 I could speak about that at length, too. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the patent and copyright system, uh, the incredible amount of litigiousness um, among uh, uh, patients of doctors, I mean, the medical, the, 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 the medical system, the medical business needs a complete overhaul. My wife is actually a doctor, so I hear a lot about this kind of thing. Well, fantastic. Well, good. I, I myself, I've been critically, I've been chronically ill for 30 years since the age of 11. I've had uh, tons of surgeries, 50 hospital stays, and I've been to the doctor hundreds of times. So I've seen it from the patient side, and that's one of sure. the reasons why I started the podcast is to to advocate for medical freedom, because I think what are the, right. a lot of the solutions that we're seeing are that are that are hurting doctors as well as patients. Right. So the same people who will, and it makes sense, get in a plane and go to, say, uh, Israel or, um, you know, the Dominican Republic or places like that for surgery are the same people who got on a train and went to neutral Moore's net 100 years ago. That's a great They're point. People looking, for, people looking for more options. And I think the more options, the better, definitely. And we had Howard, Howard Bloom on. He's a scientist, author, uh, polymath. And he was talking about, he wrote a book on re reinventing capitalism, basically, um, in, in a positive way, I think. And one of, the, one of his chapters, he talked about that in humans and in, in animals and in nature, you have pioneers within a species, bees and humans. And about 20% of the population are going to be doing things that on the outside might look crazy, but if they're right, they can have a huge positive impact for everybody else. And I think Moorsnet is, is a place where pioneers could go to try different ways of living. And we're, we're having less and less of those opportunities today. It's, it's interesting to note that at, at the turn of the century, at around, 19, around 1900, there was at least one American there. There was a Chinese person there. There were a whole bunch of Italians and a lot of Germans and other places. Some people fled there because they were they were they were fleeing basically conscription in Prussia, because Prussia fought a whole bunch of small wars during the uh, 1800s. And uh, if you were in neutral Moors net, you were exempt from conscription. There was an attempt to pass a, a, a law, or at least a create an edict, which says that if you were from Prussia and you were in neutral Moors net, you could still be conscripted. But uh, that would be hard to enforce today, let alone back then. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's, that's a good point about war. I think that people don't understand the, the impact that war has had on the history. I know we talk about... Nations and everything. Exactly. And there's so many little yeah. wars. And, they, and in your book, you talked about the amount of people that came back you know, from those wars with, as amputees or in other ways... Yeah. You know, you're not just, um, you know, if people die, which is terrible, but there's an awful cost as well when they come home. Yep. 
and one of the great cost. One of the one of the. I mean, compared to the others, it's infinitesimal. But let's add to the cost of World War One the end and the dissolution of neutral Moore's cement. And that is a true tragedy. That is that there was a place that was relatively free. And uh, it just disappeared off the map, like you talk about with the, it was just a stroke of a pin. Yep. Yeah, there was a, uh, uh, it was uh, at the, uh, again, one of the, one of the treaty signings, essentially with 30 or 40 words, it just said that neutral Moors will be integrated into Belgium. And that was the end of it. What's really interesting is that for years, people thought of it as a curiosity, but over the last few years, I'm sure not just because of my book, but the, the, the growth of uh, or the passage of ideas, people in, in, in Moorsnet or today in, uh, in, in Kelmis, the city, which was essentially the, where the mining town was and all that, they, um, they now are starting to embrace the idea that they were once a sort of a, 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 a libertarian uh, or, or a, a freedom-centric uh, uh, community or a statelet of sorts. I, I prefer the word territory. Okay, territory, gotcha. That's great yeah. that they're they're looking back at their history and they're proud of their tradition. Do you think yep. that that's going to have any impact on their local culture there? Like that's going to be a new hotbed for freedom and maybe actually go back to where it was? I I would doubt that. Uh, but the pe the people enjoy it as a sort of a an interesting twist on their heritage. But uh, I if if there are People who think they could recapture that or should, I haven't heard about it. Okay, gotcha. Now, what do you think about people who are advocating for going to Mars? I always like to ask economists about that because uh, I had on Max uh, Borders, and he talked about the moonshot uh -huh. and about the insanity and the, and the opportunity costs that come from those type of programs. And right, there, right. And there's a big push right now for that. I think that the people who want to spend my tax dollars on a on a moon mission should be the first to go. <laughs> that's that's right. We'll load them all up there. Some of them, I think, should be strapped to the outside of the rocket. Well, it, it is something yeah. that I think you know. I've been reading a lot about psychology and Carl Jung lately, and he had a real great point oh. about individuation and the idea that the external struggles that we see are actually the internal struggles with the unconscious and the conscious mind. And I think people oh, sure. yeah. people are looking for the transcendent, and I think that's what's so appealing about the moonshot that it's something bigger than other than themselves because uh, God has been so. Um, not destroyed, I hate that word, but God has been pushed out of society to a large degree, and it's been replaced with, I think, the worship of the state. What would you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I definitely think so. I think that uh, that the, whether it's religion or something else, the numinous has taken a back seat to, to you know, palpable power on earth, and uh, I don't, uh, I, I, I'm in favor of spontaneously ordered religions rather than those which have a uh, toehold in the state. That's the worst possible, I think, arrangement. But uh, it's an interesting idea that uh, that these things uh, have Jungian sort of overtones, moon missions, and taming the uh, taming the environment and all that. Um, I have the just as a person who's scientifically minded i have a general interest in knowing how those things go but i mean somebody pointed out some years ago that the bottoms of our oceans haven't been explored yet right i mean maybe we should exhaust uh the 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 the, the mysteries and the adventures of earth first and it's all another thing is that the 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 government tends to overstate the technological benefits of, of space travel. And it's always sort of a, ha a slapdash thing, like Tang. They always bring up Tang. I don't even like Tang. But, <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's always like, well, you know, Tang and then better seatbelts. And, you know, no, first of all, nothing about the government do, doing that make, makes it uh, uh, or, or should suggest that private industry couldn't have done it and probably for cheaper and probably sooner. And the second thing is, it still is a lot of money to spend on uh, on on, uh, on something of quite, those are huge huge uh, projects which the private industry could do better and um, they I, I think they're they f make people feel good they're hyper nationalist in a sense mm -hmm. but they really I don't think they pay much dividend even though some of those are touted I don't think I don't think the bang for the buck is really there. 
I would agree with that. And, and it's a propaganda campaign, too. I think NASA has its own TV channel. What if the Department of Defense was showing, you know, war all the time and showing bombs right. blowing up? And uh, I was reading about the, the overrun cost of all of these projects, whether it's the, D, you know, the DOD, um, uh, HUD, you know, they have major budget issues, you know, trillions of dollars going missing. Right. And it seems like people push these massive programs because nobody can get a handle on them because the DOD, it failed its first audit ever, you know, and they were, and they, yeah. and they, and they wanted to pat on the back for that, for, for the attempt. Yeah. I mean, in 2014, government agencies misplaced or lost something like $125 billion. And the idea that $125 billion could ever be a rounding error it's just, I mean, that's 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 unthinkable. It's unsustainable in the in the long term, but it's unthinkable that 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 the various government various government agencies will chase people down for their taxes and then treat it like like it's like it's so much, you know, uh, uh, tinder essentially, or or you know, uh, um, kindling. Uh, it, it's incredible. It's just incredible. I, nothing like this has ever happened in history, and um, I don't know. How it ends with a, bang, a, whimper, a whimper or a bang, so to speak, but whatever it is, um, people will be reading about it for the next thousand years. And I like your optimism in one of your pieces. You talked about even if authoritarians gain power temporarily, that the forces of liberty and innovations and just the human spirit eventually does prevail. Are you optimistic about the future and where things are headed? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the center can't hold. Um, what I'm concerned about is that uh, if I have a concern, it's not that liberty uh, can't take root uh, in whatever uh, sort of, um, you know, increasingly totalitarian or just uh, um, more expensive, more encroaching government is in our future, if that's the case at all. But I, I just worry about the human cost. Uh, of that transition. That's that's what concerns me. I know that there's a fire that burns inside. Every human being wants to be free to some extent or, or, or another. There are cultural differences and all that. But for the most part, people want to be free. They want to watch their kids grow up. They want to enjoy some form of material prosperity or at least have the freedom to not do that uh, or, or to live in you know a more sort of ascetic way. But uh, my concern are, is not that, that freedom, uh, again, that freedom can't, you know, uh, poke forth uh, from between the, the, I always use the example of the concrete slabs, and, you know, that one flower or blade of grass that pokes up. My, my concern is always how hard, uh, how tightly will those in control hold on? I got you. And if they'll come with a weed whacker, right? How many times are they going to take that flower down? Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and we've seen that in the Russian Revolution. I think that's why it's so dangerous that uh, people are talking about these collectivist ideas when they tout democratic socialism as something that's different than regular socialism that's been tried in the yeah. past. What are your thoughts on democratic socialism and how do you, do you, how do you explain that to people about what are the effects of that just like regular socialism? No one's really been able to explain me a difference other than that it seems like democratic socialism involves voting for someone who will become the head of a socialist state or whatever, for example, via an election, whereas socialism is what, the product of a revolution or something like that? I got you. And if that's, if that's, if that's, if that is the difference, I don't even know what it is because nobody's been able to really define it for me. If that is the difference, then it's really only a popularity contest and then, and then, and then, uh, and then essentially totalitarianism. Yeah, definitely. That's a great way to put it because I've had some people, um, you know, with my uh, videos talk about, Democratic socialism is something totally different from the socialism that led to the communist revolution. So, so what have they? What have, what have they told you? What do they see as the difference? But I think it's the voting issue. I, I do, and it's and they they yeah. don't view government as force, though. I think that's the the main issue, and that's what I was trying to explain is that they're all based upon the collectivist idea, collectivism versus individualism. Uh, and right. Ayn Rand talked about that. Uh, I think very clearly in some of her work. And that anything that's based on the collectivist principle is based on the idea that the individual doesn't matter, that only right. the group matters, even if you can vote um, to elect who controls that group. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's that's the example I always raise. If 51 percent of the people vote to kill the other 49 percent. 
how great can we say democracy is? How great can we say voting or democratic socialism is? And, you know, it's an interesting thing because I just I just finished writing the foreword to a book that's going to come out. Actually, not the foreword, the introduction. But I note in this book, um, the book is, the book is called The Counter-Revolution. It's going to be put out by the American Institute for Economic Research. And it's a reprint of a 1951 book that was written by our founder, uh, Colonel uh, Harwood. But um, I write in the foreword, you know, in the in the in the period between maybe 1885 and 1910 or so, there were successive waves of collectivist philosophies, whether it was socialism, communism, syndicalism, forms of what we would today call fascism, all came to the shores of this country and they were stillborn. None of them could get a foothold. And it, it really surprised a lot of people, especially who were uh, Marxist uh, or Marxian theoreticians, because uh, the U.S. seemed at that time to meet all the criterion for a place where socialism or, or any of these collectivist philosophies would take bloom. We have a very we, we, we are very highly industrialized. We're full of workers. Um, there's a there was a fairly high degree of inequality, allegedly that sort of thing. Uh, but yet successive waves of, uh, of collectivist philosophies could not could just couldn't survive here whether by books or orators or whatever. And in Russia, where socialism eventually took root, Russia was like the last kind of place that it should have. It was, it was agrarian, and for a number, a number of other reasons, it really has cast some doubt, or at the time, I should say, it cast doubt upon many of the precepts of uh, Marxist uh, dogma. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a great. And, and yet today, and, and yet here we are with uh, AOC and Bernie uh, capturing the imaginations of young people. It's uh, it's amazing what a difference a century makes. It is. It's a, 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 by the way, a century and a huge jump in longevity and uh, health and everything else. It is incredible about the human progress. Uh, Professor McCluskey and I talked about that. That people have sure. no idea about. Where, where humans have come from in the last 300 years and how terrible life was before the ideas yeah. of individualism I took mean, root. Poverty was, the, it, not not was, is the default state of mankind. Sickness, I just I just published an essay yesterday, an article rather. Um, sickness is the default state of mankind. We, we complain about a cold these days when people used to just drop dead of all sorts of diseases. I mean, that's, I, I, guess, I guess it's sort of a thing where I, I suppose, I hope it's not true, but I suppose the d dynamic is something like the following. Eventually, you get rich enough, you get healthy enough, you, you get successful enough that you want to, or, or that people just want to throw it away and start again. I mean, and that's what it seems like it is. That's a great point. I think Ayn Rand talked about the destroyers, that there's there's a class of people who are, uh, who are basically parasites or actually destroyers that they do actively try to destroy and take things down, uh, either because yeah. of their psychology or because they think that they're going to benefit in the long run. Yeah, I, I think I think I would just call them people who are really forgotten. They've forgotten where we came from, or, or they're just miseducated. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. most people don't take an economics class until what, they're in college? Right. That's, a, I mean, that's, I think, I don't think the impact of that particular factor can be understated. Most people don't, don't, you know, aren't confronted with the idea that supply and demand interact, and that uh, you know that's the whole thing about the MMT people is it's a kind of a, a weak academic garb, academically garbed attempt to suggest that states are not subject to supply and demand, or that money, you know, created by states is not su subject to supply and demand the same way that firms and individuals are. And so, I mean, if you think about it, by the time you're 18. If you happen at 18 to sit in an economics class, how much of your life and how many impressions have been made upon you? How much of your life has gone by? Neuroplasticity, you know, the ability of people to make connections between what they see. It might be too late, even at 18, to for, a, for a, an introduction to economics course to make a difference in their lives. We're, we're hoping to have on the authors of the Tuttle Twins. There's these series of books for children that actually talk about uh, individualism and uh, actually like uh, their um, like cartoon books of famous works in, in liberty. And I think that might be a way to help um, inoculate kids to some of that. Right, right. Yeah, I, I have heard of those. And I mean, I, I try in my daily life to, uh, you know, I, I've tried with my own kids to say, you know, if you get one M&M, you value it two more. You know, if I give you a bucket of M&Ms, that's, mm, that's nice. <laughs> right. 
uh, the idea of uh, you know uh, this downward sloping demand curve and all that. And I mean, th there's so I try to make it fun, but I I just that's one of my concerns. And I mean, it's the kind of thing where parents work long hours today. Schools have their uh, have their program have their um, uh, curricula dictated by uh, other entities, other um, uh, you know sometimes governments, sometimes other sometimes uh, teachers unions, those sorts of entities, and just no nobody. Uh, really has any incentive or reason to be concerned that kids may wind up in the workforce in some cases in their mid twenties and never have had any of the basics of economics. And I think that's a great point that it's uh, it's it is an education issue. Leonard Reed, who started the Foundation for Economic Education, that's what you know mm -hmm. back in the forties. That's what he really stressed. He's like, it's not as much as a sales job as an education job. What what's your take? How do you think that the best way for people who do believe and the ideas of liberty to to spread the word and to to see change. I guess I would say um, if you if you definitely believe in liberty or if liberty is your sort of your animating philosophy, one of the things you can do is just have conversations with people who are not libertarians. Uh, I mean, we we. It's great that we have a community, a loose community across a few think tanks, across a few institutions, and we're all, most of us are, are, are bound by the concepts and the uh, goings on in the field of cryptocurrencies and that sort of thing. But I think it's way more important, vastly more important for us to break out of the silo and uh, in, in ways that are not necessarily confrontational. In fact, that's probably the worst thing you can do. Um, but to, to challenge other people's ideas um, and to and to to use that's I mean one of the reasons why I thought it was important to write the book uh, Century of Anarchy is because so many times I would say well without government things would work this way and they say well that's a great theory but it would never work in practice. But if you look at Neutral Moore's Net, if you look at the, the Old West, which was far from wild and far from as murderous as it's made to look in movies. There's a lot of examples. There's examples in our daily lives where spontaneous order and, 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 and the ability to make choices voluntarily um, preempt or, or, or supersede what the state can and, and would do. So that's what I think the most important thing to do is to, um, to engage those um, of us who, those people we know who are not libertarians and uh, gently try and uh, let them know that they don't have the uh, the only uh, that's not the only solution there is another way I, I definitely agree with that about not having the confrontation because I, I I'm developing a concept called the future friends of freedom that it's kind of like a bridge type deal where the people mm -hmm. like you talk about most people when you actually talk to them about the ideas of liberty and how they actually live their life that they're very receptive to that those ideas and that I think we can get a long way with, uh, with helping people to take the next step towards some of these ideas that we really hold as sacred. Yeah, I mean, I, I ask friends of mine sometimes. I mean, I, I mean, most of my friends are not libertarians. Uh, some of them are. But those who are, and I say, so tell me what's different about Beto than the last ex-presidents or the last ex-candidates? Tell me what's different about him. Why does he make you fill you with hope? And they say, well, you know, he has a grassroots campaign. I'll say grassroots campaign. I mean, what does that matter? I mean, so did Bernie. So did, every, every campaign at one point calls itself a grassroots campaign. And tell me why I should be excited about populism. I mean, for, as far as I can tell, what excites people about Beto is that he rolls up his sleeves. Yeah. And that's it. I mean, and, and I roll up my sleeves too, and nobody, you know, wants to make me president. So. Well, you're not doling out. Four and a half trillion dollars. That's the problem. That's that's true. That's true. My my uh, my means are a lot less auspicious, <laughs> and I'm not giving them away. I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, if you do, it'd be voluntarily, though, right? If you, it, it's, right. I think charity is an important part of the discussion as well, because I'm sure, sure when you talk to the folks at MorseNet, you know, I'm sure there's stories about mutual aid and about kind of like a um, a de facto friendly society, just because neighbors sure. tried to rely on each other. Yeah, absolutely. And they had a, they had a, they even had what was, I, this is a thought I'd like to develop more. Um, I have a little bit more for what will probably be the second edition of this book, but um, they actually had a rifle club, which, uh, which functioned as almost like a, as an independent uh, civilian defense group, something like a, you know, the spontaneously ordered version of an army, you could say. 
almost everybody, at least by one account, almost everybody in the town, all the miners, belong to a rifle club. I think that's important too because that's uh, – I was talking with uh, my brother's father-in-law and he talked about taking a rifle to school. You know, they had shooting at actual – not school shootings. They had shooting clubs at school. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, there are still – there are still um, uh, some – I believe some ROTC programs uh, have that uh, have things like that in some high schools. Not many, though. No. But I think that your point about the civilian defense force, because that's the one thing that people, that's that last step that most people will not accept, especially with the minarchists and those with the, the night watchman state. They think that a state is right. necessary. That that one last step, the the like I think it was Gustavo Molinari, he talked about even in like the 18th century, the private um, defense forces, that the security and defense could be done by private corporations. Sure. Um, that discussion gets a little bit uh, touchy because people think of some of the private contractors in Iraq and some of those com companies, which were more corporatist than really private defense companies. But, uh, but certainly... Uh, it makes more sense, and uh, you know, a sort of a civilian irregular defense group makes a lot more sense um, in a world that has, or, or in, in a large region where this sort of thing, these sort of voluntarily, voluntarily um, derived and organized uh, uh, communities has taken has taken hold. Because I mean, Moorsnet was a small, independent, or essentially independent uh, condominium surrounded by. Big states who were who were gearing up to go to war and then eventually did. So that's that's a very uh, difficult place to be in. That is definitely it's it's a it's a very. I'm glad that you wrote that because I would never have found uh, Morsenet without that book, A Century of Anarchy. And folks, I got it off of Amazon. Is that the best place to find it? Sure, Amazon's good. Excellent. Where I have no problem. I have no problem with Jeff Bezos, so it's fine. Okay. Even though he owns the Washington Post, but that's okay. <laughs> and takes CIA money. We all have our flaws. I mean, you know. we do, and I think that's important. My brother and I talk about this a lot about separating the art from the artist kind of concept. And sure. but at the same time, what are your thoughts about not boycotts, but voting with your dollars to support certain people? You know. Absolutely, absolutely. I couldn't support it more highly. Okay. There are right. businesses, there are businesses which I personally don't engage because I don't like their practices. Even if at times I think that what they do is somewhat admirable, but usually usually it's a company that I think is is, is kind of sleazy that I won't give my money to. Yeah, I mean that's the way to do it. I mean it's not always satisfying uh, because uh, a lot of these businesses can go on for years and years, you know, and then my my dollars uh, walking away doesn't mean much to them. But uh, at the very least, you know, when somebody calls me to say, why did you cancel your service? I can say, this is why. Now, do you think the IRS... And, and have you read my book. <laughs> exactly. That's right. Do you think the IRS would be as uh, kind to call you and ask you if you uh, decided to end their service? Probably not. Probably not. I'm guessing that, uh, I'm guessing that at that point, I probably shouldn't buy any green bananas. <laughs> That's true. That is true. Now, where can people find your work, Pete? I know we talked about a century of anarchy. I highly recommend that to everybody. It is on the short side, but it's filled with footnotes as well that people that you're not going to find anywhere else on the internet. You know, those footnotes are just the aggregation of those alone are worth the. I think it was four ninety nine for the Kindle version, and it's a, it's a fascinating story. But where else can they find your work? So I have uh, a number of articles and some research I've done up on the AIER website. That's the American Institute for Economic Research, AIER.org. And they can either look for uh, my name, which is Pete Earle, E-A-R-L-E, or we have a lot of other great writers here, uh, Jeff Tucker, Max Gulker, Phil Magnus, a whole bunch of people here who write awesome things, and they're all very liberty-oriented. But that's, that's where most of my work is right now. Well, fantastic. Well, I really enjoyed our conversation today, Pete, and I learned a lot. And I, I would like to have you back on to talk more about your work in the, the, the online gaming world, creating virtual economies, and using that sure. maybe as a model for what we can see in the future of freedom. Absolutely. Well, great. Well, Thanks thank, for having you, me. thank you for being on, and thank you everyone for listening today, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.